Hi, what's up? It's me, Edit Channel Pup, the mascot for the level-headed fanboy, and today we're going to be ranking every Spider-Man film villain. Now, admittedly, I have kind of done this before in the past, back in 2019, but back then my videos were absolute dookie, and I didn't include any villains from Into the Spider-Verse, and we have had a few films since that. Plus, we've had some returning villains, so their places might have shifted around a little, so it stands to reason we're doing this again. And we have 38 villains to rank. Yeah, I actually really scraped every nook and cranny looking for villains to rank from the Spider-Man movies for this. So it's going to be quite a substantial and quite a unique list. So buckle in and prepare your butthole because it's, well, just, yeah, we're going. Now, keep in mind, this is just my personal opinion. So if you disagree, I invite you to make your own list, be it as a video or a comment down below. And if you have a problem with it and take issue with me, well, you could just fade away. Now, before we get to the main 38... We're gonna do a few honorable mentions. These are ones that I'm not gonna rank, and I'll explain why with each entry, but we got quite a few of these, which would bump the list up to around 46 if I did include them. So, honorable mentions, right. Hydro Man from Spider-Man Far From Home. He's not really a character, he's an illusion. He's very cool, but he is an illusion. Molten Man, again, same reason. Sandman from the MCU, again, same reason. Cyclone, also known as Swarm, couldn't really get a name down for this one. Again, just an illusion, not a character. Craven the Hunter, well, his film isn't out yet. Kilometers Immoralis from Earth 42, well, we just haven't seen him in action yet. We don't even know if he's going to be a villain. But he has taken up the mantle of the Prowler, so uh, he's going to be presumably a little morally grey. Venom of the Sonyverse, yes, Venom is a Spider-Man villain, but... This Venom isn't really a villain, or even an anti-hero for that matter. He's not even the antagonist of anything, he's just, he's a lovely, lovely boy. And just any and all background villains from across the Spider-Verse, so like Moosterio, Mysterio, Boring Rhino, Interesting Craven, etc, etc. So that's the reject pile, let's move on to the actual list. In at number 38 is the No Payment Pizza Lady from Spider-Man 2, and I've ranked her at 38 because she's the worst! Or maybe this is just more of a gag entry. I had to get her on the list somewhere and didn't think about it until the very end. Listen, of all of the Spider-Man villains, this is the one that probably did the most damage to the raimi vs. Peter. So much of what went wrong in Spider-Man 2 would have been fine if this horrible woman had just paid for her pizzas. And let me tell you something, I've eaten at Joe's Pizza before. The real one. Yeah, a bit of a flex, that. And listen, if it's just a couple minutes late, I can forgive it because goddamn, that is some good pizza. It might also be the fact that I'm from England and we don't really have New York pizza over here and New York pizza is just a different breed. I love it. Seriously, anyone want to send me some New York pizza? Like, I can get a P.O. box. We can arrange it. In at number 37 is Alistair Smythe from The Amazing Spider-Man 2. He's a Spider-Man villain, and he does serve to antagonize Max Dillon, kind of contributes to him becoming Electro. He's this dorky little Oscorp upstart, total micromanagement type. Hate him. Just hate him. But he gets literally nothing to do. Maybe if the Amazing Spider-Man films had continued, maybe he would have gone on to do something? And I mean, there is potential for Alistair Smythe in a Spider-Man movie. He's not one of my favorite villains ever, but eh, they could have done something cool with it. And I think BJ Novak is a cool actor for the role. In at number 36 is Norman Osborn from the Tasmverse. He's old, he's dying, he's sick, he's green around the gills, and he's a terrible father. The general basics of Norman Osborn as a character are kind of here, he's a big science whiz type, runs Oscorp, obviously, like, you know all that stuff. But it's his interactions with Harry where he really actually becomes a character. And then he dies. Another one we presumably would have seen more of had the Amazing Spider-Man series continued. But for now, he was a jerk, and then he died. In at number 35 is The Gentleman, the Nick Fury of the Sinister Six, serving only as post credit stingers or just end of movie stingers for things to come. He was a mysterious figure at the very end of the first Amazing Spider-Man film, and he got a little more to do in the second one, but again, he purely serves as just kind of a Nick Fury. We don't know anything about his motives or why he wants to start a Sinister Six. And he's just kind of lame and dated. In at number 34 is Riot. And, and this boils primarily down to Carlton Drake, who feels like a villain written by ChatGPT. He's so painfully and utterly generic, and the worst part is he could have been kind of cool. 
The kind of CEO that seems nice on the surface and that's all for show, but in actuality he's incredibly vicious and if you try to go after him, he will take everything from you. That sounds really awesome, so why is he so goddamn lame? How do you mess that up? And then when he's right, he's just a big grey monster. Next. In at number 33 is Milo Morbius, and everything good about this character boils strictly down to Matt Smith's charismatic performance because he really had very little to work with here. His motivations are basically the same as Harry Osborn's in The Amazing Spider-Man 2. I'm sick, I'm dying, why can't you give me my goddamn blood? Like a brother to Dr. Michael Morbius, he doesn't understand why Michael has let him down. But the most anyone's really gonna say about this dude is that he does a funny little dance in the third act of the film. In at number 32 is the Green Goblin of the Tasmverse. It's another instance where we don't really know very much about this character because of very limited screen time. He lacks that kind of very deliberate sadism that the Green Goblin typically has, and it's because they're going for a more diseased version of this character. Like, he's more sick than he is outright evil. And I guess you could say that about other depictions of the Green Goblin as well, as is the Goblin Serum that does turn Norman Osborn into the monster that he is. But in this case, that deliberacy to the character, that very sadistic streak just isn't here. He's just more of a monster. It's not helped by the fact that, listen, I like Dane DeHaan as Harry Osborn. Not very fond of his goblin depiction though. And good god, what is going on with this design? How do you manage to go so far in so many different directions and have them all be the wrong direction? I don't get it. In at number 31 is the Rhino from The Amazing Spider-Man 2. He screams a lot, he's hammy, he's Russian. His Rhino mech shoots rockets instead of doing the things that rhinos usually do, but he's at least kind of fun to watch, and I think the Rhino mech looks cool. Hot take, I don't mind the Rhino being in a mech, it just makes a whole lot more sense. I just wish that mech did more Rhino-y things. Last I checked, rhinos don't shoot rockets. You don't even see him do a proper rhino charge, what is this? He slowly stomps through the city for most of his appearance. There's some potential here, but it's definitely not brought to life. In at number 30, we have the Green Goblin from Miles' universe, who appeared in Into the Spider-Verse. There's not really a lot to say about this one, given that, again, limited screen time, and the character is for the most part a mute. Now, I'm not really fond of the ultimate version of the Green Goblin, which this definitely takes more of its cues from. However, I will say, design-wise, he at least still looks more like the Green Goblin than the Green Goblin of the Ultimate Universe, who just looks more like a Hulk with horns. Funnily enough, this was the very first cinematic Green Goblin to have a purple hood on his head. He's not technically augmented, he doesn't fly around on a glider, this is very much the Ultimate Goblin. However, I must say, that was actually quite a good choice. There wasn't really any intention of making Green Goblin a major villain in Into the Spider-Verse, and given that, you know, Miles Morales originates from the Ultimate Universe, it's kind of a nice touch that he got an Ultimate Green Goblin. So I don't hate it. And again, design-wise, I think he's pretty alright. Even if it isn't my preference as far as Green Goblin designs go, it at least knows fully what it wants to do. In at number 29 is Mac Gargan from the MCU. Now again, this is another one where I can't really say a lot because he's limited by very little screen time. And he's also yet to really get his scorpion design, however there are little teases such as the little scorpion tattoo that he's got on his neck. Mac Gargan is one of the Vulture's clients wanting to buy illegal weapons. And when they both end up in the slammer, he tries to intimidate Vulture into giving him Spider-Man's secret identity. But of course, Vulture plays it off cool. There's kind of a cool setup here for a villain that wants revenge on Spider-Man. One who's truly a twisted psycho. As Matt Gargan does have an extensive criminal record, including Homicide. Two movies later though, and we still haven't seen him again. Hopefully for MCU Spider-Man 4, as I do think Scorpion is a great candidate for a Spider-Man villain in the films, and we're yet to really see him in live action. Maybe he's yet to take center stage. It's helped by the fact that his beef is undeniably with Spider-Man and not Peter Parker. In at number 28 is Dr. Kafka. This gender-bent version of Dr. Kafka is a very early 2000s, late 90s kind of character, 
Not one I expected to see in the 2010s. The over-the-top zany German scientist. That wasn't good, but you know what, we're gonna leave it in. I don't know, I, j I just found him fun. He's cruel to Max, he's a very sadistic guy, seemingly taking pleasure in Max's pain, and it's pretty cathartic when we finally see said pain inflicted on him. As just a side villainy thing, in a film that would commit to a fully cartoony tone, He'd be great. And I must say I do still like the more cartoony aspects of The Amazing Spider-Man 2 in of themselves, so it, it's kind of, it's hard for me to dislike this guy. How the hell do you have Green Goblin and Dr. Kafka in the same movie and have Dr. Kafka end up more charismatic? I, I don't get it. In at number 27 is Donald Menken, a shareholder at Oscorp. And easily the most grounded and serious villain in The Amazing Spider-Man 2, keeping Harry under strict and tight surveillance, just waiting for any kind of slip-up he can manufacture to take the company away from him. Covering up the inhumane experiments going at Ravencroft, he's a truly ruthless fella. Just goes to show what investors can do if they have a dirty strategy. And as a lawyer, he also knows how to trip Harry up. More of an antagonist for Harry than Peter, but still, he's doing evil things. In at number 26 is Dr. Ratha, as portrayed by the late Irfan Khan. Another more grounded character. However, he wouldn't necessarily make this list were it not for a deleted scene from The Amazing Spider-Man. So as it stands, he's a supervisor to Dr. Kirk Connors, overseeing the Limb Regeneration Project. He was also overseeing Richard Parker's Spider Project. However, before Kurt knew that the formula was ready to save Osborne, Ratha was ready to rush it over to him regardless of the consequences. You could say he's acting out of compassion and desperation, but you could also say that he's incredibly short-sighted. But what makes him a villain to me is that this man clearly knows more than he's letting on, as it's hinted that he's been keeping Peter under tight surveillance and following his every move. He knows what happened to Peter's parents, and he knows that Peter becoming Spider-Man wasn't an accident. He's a very mysterious character, and it's a shame they just killed him off. In an online Daily Bugle website, no less. In at number 25 is the Scorpion from Into the Spider-Verse, who by no means serves as any kind of main antagonist in this film, although he does get a fairly decent amount of screen time. Scorpion is really just hired muscle effectively, and by muscle I really mean it because this is a very beefed up version of the Scorpion. I really like his little robo scorpion legs and his giant claw, and the fact that his scorpion tail looks kind of organic. He speaks with a thick accent and he really enjoys what he does. For as cartoony and over the top as this take on the scorpion is, I really enjoyed him. In at number 24 is the Vulture from Across the Spider-Verse. This Italian version of the Vulture is inspired by Renaissance artwork. And while there's not a great deal to this character other than him being just this very scenery chomping villain who enjoys drinking espresso. He's so damn cool because of his animation style. And yeah, it's really all about the animation style here, but I also appreciate kind of the infusion with Italian Renaissance culture as well. So yeah, it's pretty sweet. In at number 23 is Tombstone. Kingpin's surprisingly loyal right-hand man, and he's a man of few words, which in many ways makes him a little more intimidating and makes you take him really seriously when he speaks. And he's very quick to serve Kingpin, nearly icing Olivia Octavius when she doesn't catch the Spider-Men. That said, how tough can he be when he got beaten up by Aunt May with a baseball bat? Yeah, he also serves as kind of a fall guy too, getting choked out by Olivia Octavius and getting the stones beaten out of him by Spider-Man Noir. This subservient little sycophant is pretty decent. In at number 22 is the Prowler from the MCU, as played by Donald Glover, which is kind of nice given that Donald Glover was very much the inspiration for Miles Morales and did want to play the role at an early stage. This version of the character kind of starts his run looking for illegal weapons in Queens when he does deals with the Vulture. However, he eventually agrees to help Spider-Man to protect his nephew, as he doesn't want his nephew growing up in a community where people can just run amok with alien weapons. However, that wasn't the last we'd see of this version of Aaron Davis. Now, it is questionable as to whether or not this is the main character, but the Prowler did appear in Across the Spider-Verse as played by Donald Glover in live action, in the full Prowler suit, just minus the mask. And he was, of course, apprehended by Hobie Brown, 
but does this mean he was exploring somebody else's universe? Is there maybe a canon event that we're about to see? Could that canon event tie in with an MCU Miles becoming Spider-Man? Yeah, there's a lot of speculation to be had, but with that being said, Donald Glover's portrayal of Aaron Davis is a pretty enjoyable character from the very little screen time that he's had. I hope that we haven't seen the last of him and that he'll maybe factor into an MCU Miles story. In at number 21 is Jessica Drew. Not really a villain as such, but an antagonist nonetheless, as she stands in the way of Miles Morales in Across the Spider-Verse, working side by side with Miguel O'Hara, taking extreme measures to safeguard the multiverse. She's a prospective mother and a family woman at heart, as she does also serve as kind of a motherly figure to Gwen Stacy. But she can be stern and no-nonsense as hell when it comes to Miles Morales. And when it came to the chase of all the Spider-People trying to catch and detain him, I don't know why, but she just straight up kicked Miles in the gut. What is your problem? I think things are going to get pretty complicated between her and Gwen. In at number 20 is Ben Riley, aka the Scarlet Spider from Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. A subservient right-hand man to Ben Riley. What? I think I meant Miguel O'Hara. Yeah, Ben Riley is the right-hand man to Ben Riley. W well done. Now, this is a very simplified adaptation of Ben Riley from the comic books anyways. Like, I don't think he was ever meant to serve the same purpose. He's much more of a comedic relief take, much more of a parody of Ben Riley. There's nothing to really say that this guy is a clone of Peter Parker aside from his striking resemblance. In this case, he's a guy tortured by his traumatic past, and he's a total himbo, and I gotta say he got a lot of laughs out of me. No, he might not do the comic book version of the character justice, but at the same time, A, I think we're lucky to just have a big screen adaptation of the character full stop, and B, I still really enjoyed this version. He's very literal and narrates everything he's saying, and yeah, that internal narration was quite a big part of those Ben Riley Spider-Man comics. I can understand why Ben Riley fans were maybe a little upset with this, but personally, I really enjoyed this take on the character. And my god, the way they've translated his look to the animation as well is just chef's kiss. Because he looks fantastic. In at number 19 is Shriek from Venom Let There Be Carnage. Cletus Cassidy's devoted loyal accomplice, his one bright light as he calls her. But these two are kind of star-crossed as her super ability is being able to scream at like supersonic waves and a symbiote's weakness is sound. This Shriek, though, she grew up at St. Estes before spending the majority of her life at Ravencroft, and with that, she hasn't really matured as a person. She's very much like this insolent child. Unfortunately, I will say, though, that this character does feel a bit more like an accessory to Carnage than she does really a character in her own right, which is why she is a little lower on this list than, you know, Carnage is. But I still really enjoyed this character, especially when she actually turned on Carnage himself. She didn't exactly die a hero, but she did die defeating Carnage, so there you go. In at number 18 is Jackson Bryce, aka Montana, aka Shocker, from Spider-Man Homecoming. Interesting to see one of the Enforcers get adapted into live action, but even more interesting that we're skipping straight to him becoming the Shocker, rather than really seeing him as a member of the Enforcers. However, when you think about it, the Enforcers is a big supervillain criminal gang, and in this movie, he is very much part of a big supervillain criminal gang. Maybe that's the MCU's take on the Enforcers. I don't know, maybe it's an homage. That being said, he is the first guy to dawn the Shocker's gauntlets, and the only one to dawn the full Shocker get up, well, excluding the mask anyway. Montana is a maverick in Toombs' operations. He doesn't do as he's told, he doesn't show up to work on time, he's the guy that basically does what he does to get paid and that's it, but he's also having fun on the job while breaking the rules of said job, potentially jeopardizing Vulture's covert operation by shooting off the alien weapons in the open and dubbing himself as the Shocker. He's someone who the Vulture can't control, and so he bites the dust albeit accidentally. And thus, the gauntlets are passed on over to Herman Schultz, aka Shocker number two. But we'll get to that, as in at number 17 is the Tinkerer, another member of Vulture's covert operations, serving as the engineer of the alien weapons, customizing them, augmenting them, and working on Vulture's tech as well. You gotta think, if Adrian Toomes is this blue collar worker, yes, he's very good at management, but that doesn't mean he's necessarily gonna be good at the kind of cosmic science that would be required to utilize these things. 
So it's a good thing that they have the Tinker around, and it's a great bit of world building, making the character of the Vulture more believable. The Tinker is also suitably dorky. Like, I think his defining moment is just when he answers one of Adrian Toomes' calls, and he just gently goes, Toomes' phone, when he picks up. It's just, it's really funny. Again, very limited screen time with this one, but I will say that limited screen time did leave something of an impression, and I really enjoyed this character. I'd like to see more of him working alongside maybe other villains that might not be so scientifically minded, but still have scientific augmentations. I think there's mileage to be had. In at number 16 is Herman Schultz, aka The Shocker. Herman Schultz is a lot more straight-laced than Montana. He's a guy who's willing to take orders, cash his check, and go home. But he is someone who Vulture can rely on to actually do the job properly, often serving as the point of sales for the alien weapons. Herman Schultz isn't here for fun, he's here to do his job, and he's here to get paid. And with it, he's a man of few words. However, one thing I will say that I really enjoyed about this version of The Shocker is how he gradually grew to love his Shocker gauntlet, eventually finding some enjoyment in the job of beating up Spider-Man. And the fight in the bus yard is as fun as it is because of those rich characterizations from both Spider-Man and the Shocker. He's a bit more of a slow burn than other Spider-Man villains, but I'd be happy to see him again, and I think we should. There's always room for side villains in Spider-Man movies, I think, and Shocker's a great choice. I really like Bokeem Woodbine as an actor as well, and I just I want to see him get more to do in the MCU. You. In at number 15 is the new goblin. As a kid, I was pretty disappointed that we didn't really get like a scenery chewing green goblin like what we have with Willem Dafoe. Harry is not as sadistic as his father. He doesn't attack civilians, he doesn't attack innocents. His beef is strictly personal. His business is purely with Peter Parker and Mary Jane. And he's acting out of obsession, obsession over the loss of his father, wanting to make him proud in death because he couldn't do it in life. He suffers from delusions as hallucinations of Norman Osborn taunt and torture him. And look, yeah, as a kid, yeah, of course I was a little disappointed that he wasn't as charismatic as his father was, and I, yeah, I guess you could say I was a little disappointed that he didn't get a goblin-y look either. However, at the same time, I think now as an adult, now that I can appreciate this character on a more mature level, I actually really appreciate those differences between him and his father. He's not just Little Goblin Jr. He's very much his own character, and Harry Osborn doesn't get lost in the character of the Goblin, which does show some admittedly great restraint from the writers and Sam Raimi. He definitely doesn't leave the same impression that other Raimi Spider-Man villains do, but I think we had a really good conflict here, and I think that's what I appreciate about this, is Harry is a better character than he is a villain. In at number 14 is the Kingpin. A nasty gangster with a lack of any kind of humility, and absolutely no mercy for his enemies. And because of that, he alienated his family, eventually leading to their deaths in a car accident. Unlike Spider-Man though, he's not out to take responsibility for that, he just wants to pluck another one from the multiverse. And things only get worse when he alienates that one too while attacking another Spider-Man. He's not someone who'll reflect on his behaviors and change, and views his family as purely replaceable. Kingpin is just a disgusting, tasteless man, devoid of any kind of compassion, any kind of sincerity, and any kind of humanity. He doesn't want his family back so they can get their lives back, he wants them back just for himself. But it all kind of comes to a head when he holds a ceremony for Spider-Man and he puts on all the crocodile tears as a cover-up for his Collider experiment. He's a nasty, irredeemable person. And also, I really want to see how he wipes his ass. In at number 13 is Electro, who previously would have rocked up way lower on this list. But Electro has now had two live-action appearances, and they do seem to be kind of the same version of the character overall. In The Amazing Spider-Man 2, Electro didn't really work, but he did have his redeeming qualities. He was very fun to watch, I'll say that much, but he was kind of too over-the-top, too cartoony, and completely at odds with Jamie Foxx's natural charisma, as this was more of an embittered nerd. However, we do revisit this version of Electro in Spider-Man No Way Home with a much more subtle and far improved design that is much more in line with the 616 comics, as opposed to the more ultimate look of the original Amazing Spider-Man 2 Electro. But also, they completely overhauled this character to the point where I actually don't think it's the same character. I think it's more of a variant. Still played by Jamie Foxx, still from a universe adjacent to the Amazing Spider-Man 2, but I think this is a different character. Because for one, 
this one factors much more of Jamie Foxx's natural charisma into the role. He's not this embittered nerd, even though it is implied that he used to be, but the main thing that tells me that this guy is from a different universe is because Electro doesn't know who Spider-Man is, yet what this story hinges on is these villains knowing who Spider-Man is in their own dimensions. Well, Electro was one of the only Spider-Man villains to not find out Peter's identity. The only villain that found out Peter's identity in that film was Green Goblin. So yeah, I think it's an adjacent version. Still, I'm going to put them in the same category. Electro is much better in Spider-Man No Way Home. His characterization comes much more naturally to Jamie Foxx and utilizes much more of Jamie Foxx's acting style. He doesn't feel miscast or at odds with the actor like he did in Amazing Spider-Man 2. His design is a lot more sensible. And what I like about Electro is that he's one of the villains that doesn't want to go home. Because electricity manifests differently in the MCU and he likes the additional power that that gives him. He's someone who enjoys his power, unlike say Sandman or Doc Ock. Electro's a lot of fun. It's nice to have a character who is redeemable but still enjoys his powered up villain status. And I like the kind of charismatic rapport that he does have with the protagonists of the film as well. In at number 12 is the Lizard. Once again we've got two appearances here, one in The Amazing Spider-Man and one in Spider-Man No Way Home. But to be honest, I don't think his appearance in Spider-Man No Way Home really makes a difference to where I'd rank this one, because he gets very little to do in Spider-Man No Way Home. In fact, I think I enjoyed him more in The Amazing Spider-Man 1, because I didn't really feel like they did his character wrong by any stretch. And he just has more to do in that movie. Admittedly, I didn't like the whole, I'm gonna turn the world into lizards thing. I, I didn't like that. But Amazing Spider-Man 1 is just much more focused on the lizard, where he's more of a side villain in Spider-Man No Way Home. That being said, No Way Home didn't really do anything wrong with the lizard as such. But I really enjoy him in The Amazing Spider-Man because of how hammy the sort of dual personality is. When he's just screaming through gritted teeth that Peter Parker is not going to get in the way of his plans. He's one of the few aspects of The Amazing Spider-Man 1 that feels like a leftover from the Raimi era. It at least feels very in touch with what I loved about the Raimi films. The lizard is just wonderfully over the top and hammy. But then... I feel like we don't get enough of Dr. Connors. I don't feel like we get enough of a grasp on his kind of humanity, you know? And I don't think that Spider-Man No Way Home fixed that in any sense. The only difference being that I don't think No Way Home was obligated to explore that, while Amazing Spider-Man 1 probably was. It's by no means bad, but there just isn't a lot there. In at number 11 is Carnage. Another one where I don't really think the character has done justice, but I still really enjoy this version of the character. But again, I think you'd kind of have to get a lot wrong to really make Carnage not an interesting character. He's a homicidal maniac imbued with the power of the symbiote. Now, quite a major departure from the comic version of Carnage is that Carnage in this case is kind of his own character separate from Cletus Cassidy. The symbiote and Cletus talk to each other, whereas in the comic they're in such perfect synchronization that they don't even refer to each other as like we, they just, they are one, effectively. And I think that's the main thing they kind of got wrong with this depiction of the character. But as I say, you have to go a long way to really mess this up, because I still really enjoy the characterization of both the Carnage symbiote combined with Cletus Cassidy. It's Cletus who really steals the show here, and it's nice to just have a scenery-chewing psychopath, completely irredeemable, constantly feels sorry for himself, mentally a child. Cletus Cassidy was just a lot of fun to watch in Venom Let There Be Carnage. Woody Harrelson is great in the role of this very cartoony, unhinged, very hammy character, and he is congruent with the tone of the film as well this time, unlike, say, Dr. Kafka or Rhino, so Carnage just ends up being a blast to watch. I don't think he's a great adaptation of the character by any stretch, but I do really enjoy him as a character in his own right. In at number 10 is Olivia Octavius, aka Doc Ock from Into the Spider-Verse. Olivia Octavius is the architect of the Alchemax Collider. There's a lot of vowels there. Working under Kingpin. And she initially seems like a bit of an ally to the spiders, until she is revealed to be Doc Ock, which was a completely surprise reveal. Of all of the villains in Into the Spider-Verse, Olivia Octavius is the most fun one. She is the most archetypal Spider-Man villain of the bunch. With Kingpin, you've got this very grumbly guy, you've got a lot of his mercenaries who are just very quiet characters. Prowler is sort of a very serious, sort of more kind of an anti-hero character. But Olivia Octavius is just everything you want from a Spider-Man villain. Campy, cartoony, scenery-chewing, charismatic, and it's cool that she just appears by complete surprise. 
guys. You've also got that very sort of faux friendliness that a lot of like, say, actress Catherine Han's roles are kind of known for. Whenever she plays like a, a villainous character, there's a very faux friendliness to her, and that comes across greatly here. Just really makes for a nice layer on top of that sort of scenery chomping villainy. So Olivia Octavius, really cool villain. Oh, we're in the single digits now. In at number nine is Sandman, the original killer of Uncle Ben in the Rainyverse. A specter that has haunted Peter Parker since he was a teenager. But what makes this version of Sandman so amazing is that despite his appearance as a giant sand kaiju, he's not a monster. He's merely a man, and Peter Parker has to kind of confront that. And from there, he learns to forgive. See, everything he does, every crime he commits, he does to help afford the medical bills for his sick daughter, Penny. And he didn't even intentionally kill Uncle Ben. It was a complete accident, as Dennis Carradine tried to rush him, still making Dennis Carradine technically responsible for Uncle Ben's death. Because we know of Sandman's humanity, because we know of his turmoil, when we see him fight against Spider-Man, unrestrained by the black suit, out for blood effectively, Sandman becomes kind of more victim than villain, and that's a really interesting change-up of that dynamic. He's a lot less interesting in Spider-Man No Way Home, as he really just, he wants to go home. Of all the villains, he's the one that most wants to go home. He knows he's not gonna die if he does, and he wants to be with his daughter Penny again. What I like is that he begins as more of an ally to Peter Parker, before turning on him due to his own sense of trust issues, while also being in a completely different universe where he doesn't know anyone's true intentions. So it makes for an interesting dynamic, especially when juxtaposed with Electro, who doesn't even want to go home. And also his sand powers are just done so, so well. They were really ahead of their time with this one. In at number eight is the Prowler from Into the Spider-Verse. Aaron Davis, the loving uncle to Miles Morales, someone who went down a completely different path to his brother, the straight-laced cop Jefferson Davis. Now, the Prowler is kind of a more silent character, represented more by his appearance and his background theme, which is, oh my god, it's terrifying. That sound never fails to put the shits up me. He's one of Kingpin's henchmen. He quietly does as he's told, but he has this defining moment on the roof of the Parker household where he unmasks Miles. And there's a moment of conflict between his orders for Kingpin, doing what he needs to do to survive, and wanting to do what's right for his family. And that is the key difference between him and Kingpin. He doesn't want his family around unconditionally, he wants to do right by them. And because of that, he pays the price as Kingpin guns him down. Much more of an anti-hero than a villain, really, in that respect. As he doesn't really have any evil plans of his own, he's just kind of doing as he's told, and then he decides to go against his orders when it comes to family. Prowler is great. When he's a villain, he's got a real presence to him. But when it comes down to it, Uncle Aaron is not a bad guy. In at number seven, we have Venom from the Raimiverse, which I understand might be a bit of a controversial pick, as I know that a lot of people were really disappointed by this version of the character. However, I love Raimi Venom. Raimi's Venom is much less the sort of late 90s, early 2000s sort of lethal protector Venom, and certainly less that sort of hulking monster. In this case, he's much more of a dark reflection to Spider-Man himself. And those are the parts of the character that Sam Raimi really emphasizes the most. We don't have that We Are Venom dual personality here either. Eddie Brock is basically everything that Peter Parker would have become if he kept the symbiote. An irresponsible, hot-headed narcissist. Someone happy to lie and cheat his way through life and is only really sorry for getting caught, as evidenced in the scene where Peter Parker exposes him as a fraud to the Daily Bugle, and then rather than repent for any of this, he just goes to pray for the death of Peter Parker. He's someone who believes himself entitled to Gwen Stacy. So basically what the Raimi version of Venom asks is what would happen if someone who is the complete opposite of Peter Parker were to get the powers of Spider-Man. And thus we have the Venom of the Raimiverse, and I just think that's such an interesting character. And the design really complements that as well. No, he's not a hulking monster like that sort of Todd McFarlane era sort of Venom. While he is a little larger than Spidey himself, he is much more kind of human in his proportions, and I think this was more to kind of play up that he is a dark mirror to Spider-Man. Another example being that his costume has webs on it, just like Spider-Man's does, but his webs are all distorted and broken. It's much more what would the Spider-Man costume look like were it evil. 
It might not be the all-encompassing adaptation of Venom that people maybe wanted at the time, but it takes the parts of the character that I like the most and really plays them up and brings them to the very surface. And for that reason, I really enjoy Raimi's take on Venom. In at number six is the MCU Vulture. Sometimes the whole, oh, they're the villain you can root for kind of thing, you know, it can be a bit cliched because like sometimes it just feels like, oh, they have a sad story, so therefore I want to root for them. In this case, I actually kind of get it though. As the MCU's Vulture, as played by Michael Keaton, was originally a blue collar worker made redundant by Tony Stark, monopolizing his business effectively. And so because he's been forced out by the wealthy billionaires and the industries, uh, he's going for more of a covert, underground, illegal weapons black market deal. As he started the business in retrieving the leftovers of the MCU's cosmic battles, and transforming them into weapons that can be bought by just the sort of the ground level gangsters of the MCU. And he's not gonna let anyone step in his way because of that, because ultimately he's trying to provide for his family, particularly his daughter Liz Allen, and we are shown that despite being a criminal, he's a really good father. Someone who's willing to go to the ends of the earth for his family, even if it means killing Spider-Man. I honestly kind of get it. He's someone who's willing to bend the rules. But I also like that there is a kind of a mutual respect between him and Spider-Man as well. Also, his design is just a really cool adaptation of that classic Vulture look. I love how he's not wearing green pajamas anymore, but there are still green accents on his suit. That's how you adapt a character design that would look silly in real life. In at number five is The Spot from Across the Spider-Verse. First of all, this dude's origin story happened in plain sight and nobody noticed. Like, it's all well and good having a villain that was there all along and is tied to the origins of the character, but oftentimes it can come off with just kind of bogus or tacked on. In this case, it's pretty airtight. So he's a really meticulously built character. But I love how the Spot and Miles when in conflict feel more like two brothers who hate each other having a bit of a tussle. They both bring out the more immature side in each other, as Spot really wants to prove himself as Spider-Man's arch enemy in the same way that Miles wants to prove himself as Spider-Man. What do you get when you have two men who are young at heart conflicting over wanting to prove themselves? you tend to just get a really immature little slap fight. And yeah, that lines up. I really love these two together. And the spot himself is just so immensely watchable. He's incredibly charismatic. He's kind of a dorky loser in the best way, but he's so determined to prove himself that he does actually go on to become an eldritch horror. You don't take him seriously at first, but he definitely proves himself. And I can't wait to see what he's gonna go on to do in Beyond the Spider-Verse. But as far as first impressions go, yeah, this guy's great. He's one of the best. In at number four is Miguel O'Hara. Not really a villain so much as kind of, I guess, an anti-hero. He's, he's an antagonist to Miles anyway. This is more of an antagonist list than it is a villain list. Now, Miguel comes off as a jackass, acting as though Miles did a heinous thing and is completely to blame for things that he was completely unaware of. For things that he had absolutely no control over. Yeah, okay, so the spider that bit Miles was an anomaly. A spider brought into his world from another dimension that wasn't supposed to bite him causing events to take a very different shape in his universe than what they were supposed to. But Miles didn't know any of that, and in no way was any of that his fault, so Jesus Christ, Miguel, get off his back. And yeah, his way of handling Miles and just what Miles is gonna have to confront with his father dying is incredibly heartless and inhumane. However, I do buy it because he's coming from a place of absolute desperation. Miguel is someone who himself has lost family, has lost everything, and like Kingpin, he tried to go into another dimension and swap them out for another one. He tried to get a second chance effectively, and it resulted in the collapse of that universe, resulting in the death of his family at his own hands effectively. He's seen the consequences of this play out in front of his very eyes, and they are huge. The stakes are incredibly high, so I can kind of sympathize with him. Doesn't change the fact he's an asshole, though. In at number three is Doc Ock of the Raimiverse, appearing in both Spider-Man 2, like literally the best movie ever made, and Spider-Man No Way Home, which is just a really good movie, you know? Now, as cool as that Doc Ock in No Way Home basically moves on to total hero status, as the inhibitor chip in the tentacles is is restored by Tom Holland's Spider-Man and Willem Dafoe's Norman Osborn, allowing him to be himself again, and that's a really wonderful thing. And when that happens, he commits himself to helping to cure the other 
enemies and help Tom Holland Spider-Man. The dude even briefly throws down with the Green Goblin, it's really cool. And that's what makes Doc Ock great, is the fact that Dr. Octavius is fundamentally a good man. A good man being effectively puppeted by the tentacles he created. A man driven by dreams of using his scientific gifts for the benefit of mankind. What happens to him, him becoming a monster, is tragic. And in his home dimension, in his first appearance that we see him, he takes his first moment of clarity since becoming Doc Ock as a chance to die as a human rather than a monster. He is hoping he made a different decision after going back home cured. In at number two is Green Goblin of the Raimiverse. We've got kind of a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde thing going on between Norman and his Green Goblin persona. He's a scientist backed into a corner by a military contract pulling out and losing his company. So he moves this goblin serum forward to human trials and tests it on himself prematurely, resulting in him suffering from split personality, psychosis, and homicidal tendencies. Worse yet, he's imbued with all of his Oscorp tech, making him a real danger. And he's the kind of guy where once he makes an enemy, he's going to torture them. And of course, he makes the enemy of Spider-Man, eventually finding out he's Peter Parker and stops at nothing to torture him. Green Goblin is vicious, sadistic, and just cruel on another level, to the point that he's even so callous that when he does make it to another dimension, his first thing he chooses to do is completely ruin another Spider-Man's life, effectively throwing his own Spider-Man aside. Yes, I too lament the fact that the Green Goblin and Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man had pretty much zero interactions in Spider-Man No Way Home. But at the same time, that one moment of Toby Spider-Man saving him, only for Goblin to then just stab him in the back quite literally, he just throws him aside like he's nothing because he's got a new Spider-Man to play with now. I kind of like that. I wish maybe we could have just had some interaction between the two where Goblin's just like, look, I don't need you anymore, you know, I got a new Spider-Man now. And now, rather than being impaled in the balls by his own glider, dying at his own hands, he's going back to his home dimension carrying all of the guilt of everything he's done, which is in some ways more of a punishment than it is a mercy. But the absolute best thing about Green Goblin is Willem Dafoe's performance. Willem Dafoe turns in an absolutely unrestrained performance as Green Goblin both times, and can make this very horror movie villain performance work with, I guess in some cases, a more emotionally grounded tone. Yes, Spider-Man 1 was a much more campy, over-the-top, silly sort of comic book movie, but his performance works just as well in Spider-Man No Way Home, which is a little more grounded in some sense. But I guess that's just the power of Willem Dafoe. And in at number one, you probably saw it coming, yes, I'm biased, I don't care. In at number one, we have Mysterio from Spider-Man Far From Home. Now, I'm gonna say this right now, I think it's a fantastic movie. I can understand why there are some that don't like it, but I do think the level of hate that it does get on social media is pretty forced. But I, I just wanna assert, best villain doesn't necessarily mean best movie. I think the best Spider-Man movie is probably between Spider-Man 2 and Across the Spider-Verse. Spider-Man Far From Home is good, but it's not the best. But Mysterio is, in my opinion, the best villain of the bunch. And it does partially come from the fact that Mysterio is my favorite comic book villain of all time as well. But also just that they took everything that I love about the comic version and brought it to the big screen in live action. Even then though, I feel like Mysterio in Far From Home really kind of elevates the Spider-Man villain status. He kind of really stepped up the bar, which is insane considering that Spider-Man has one of the best rogues gallery in all of comics and the same absolutely applies to the films. What I love about Mysterio is that fundamentally he is powerless. He is a nasty, vicious, vindictive, homicidal maniac and con man. And worst yet, he's an expert liar. In Spider-Man Far From Home, Peter is grappling with a lot of sort of imposter syndrome. And Mysterio recognizes this and he absolutely preys on it in every sense possible. Going so far as to trap Peter in his own personal nightmare. Peter is grappling with inadequacy, not believing that he is the hero that the world needs, trying to live up to a legacy that isn't his own, and Quinton Beck has basically created this Mysterio persona to basically show Peter everything he's not. A confident, mature, swashbuckling expert, truly worthy of being the world's protector. That's just nasty. And as soon as Peter picks up that Mysterio is a fraud, He's out for blood, he's gonna kill him and all of his friends in broad goddamn daylight. And with Mysterio, you still get the spectacle of these crazy action sequences. We still have a guy who can basically use drone technology to manufacture nightmares for people. But I love that what it boils down to, what that final battle 
between Peter and Quentin Beck dials down to is a man with a gun. Because that's all Mysterio really is. He's just an asshole. But of all of Spidey's film villains, I don't think any one of them has ever backed Spidey into the corner that Mysterio has. Sure, Green Goblin killed Aunt May, but without Mysterio completely turning Peter's life upside down to the point where he needed to beg Doctor Strange to wipe everybody's memory, none of that would have happened, and the multiverse would, I don't know, probably still be intact. Either that or the MCU would have found some other reason to do a multiverse saga. I mean, it's a different reason every movie, goddammit. And that's the thing, is that Mysterio is always several steps ahead of Spidey. He couldn't trick him anymore with his illusions, so he just sicked a load of drones on him. Peter defeated the drones. He tried to shoot him. Peter was able to stop that. Peter was able to just stop everything Mysterio did, seemingly with Mysterio dying, and yet he still found a way to win in exposing Peter Parker's identity and framing him. That is insane. Mysterio doesn't have any genuine innate power. He's just an incredibly smart, psychotic, and frankly irredeemable guy. Showing that with the right resources, a smart, utterly empathyless man can be one of the worst things Spider-Man could ever tangle with. And the specter of Mysterio still looms over Spider-Man in the MCU even today, as because of him, nobody knows who Peter Parker is. Spider-Man has lost everything, and none of that would have happened without Mysterio. Spider-Man No Way Home was about proving kind of how every Spider-Man villain can be redeemed. How there are cures for even the worst of the worst. Even Norman Osborn is cured. But Mysterio is completely irredeemable. Also, he has a fishbowl on his head, which I think is pretty awesome. I also, yeah, I just really appreciate how faithful they were to Mysterio's classic comic design. I hope we haven't seen the last of old fishbowl. You know, I think now is actually the perfect time to bring him back. MCU Spider-Man 4, or maybe 5, Peter gets the symbiote suit, he's unrestrained, he's off the chains, he's merciless, he's undefeatable, and he discovers that Mysterio is still out there, and he's out for blood, but because Mysterio doesn't remember who Peter Parker is, he's fighting against someone who doesn't really even know what he's done. Now that would be one hell of a way to flip the script. Seriously, if you're gonna put him in the black suit and bring out Peter's rage, I say bring out the person that did the most damage to him. So that's my list. Was that a little longer than you were expecting? It's definitive for now until the next movie, when I'll have to do this all over again. But what do you guys think? What's your ranking? What do you think of my ranking? Comment below, discuss, the floor is yours down there. And as always, if you enjoyed this video and you want to support more like it, be sure to hit subscribe, hit the like button, and in the description below is a link to my Patreon, where for as little as $1 a month, you can get your name in the credits of these videos. It's like you're famous or something. But most of all, I just really, really, really appreciate it. Patrons in the $10 tier get an extra special shout-out, with more decibels than the usual. For example, we have Glad Goku, Sharif Pai, Dare Denny, Kale Bennett, That Jordo, Ken K from Warheads, Legendary Ray Ray, Is Sonic Team Making You Blue? Dimps leaving you dumped, Big Red Button giving you a big red headache, Try Sonic the Critic, Sergio, Sir is the Skeptic, the previous person is selling pictures of their weenus! Yeah. Oh, my head's tingling now. Oh. And in the $5 tier, we have SSS06, Dazzle Fizzle, and Vera Wild. Thank you all so much for your generosity and your support, and to those of you at home watching, Thank you so much for doing so, and have a great day.